Chapter 11 Camp Tabera The people fell to grumbling over their hard life. God heard. When he heard, his anger flared. Then fire blazed up and burned the outer boundaries of the camp. The people cried out for help to Moses. Moses prayed to God, and the fire died down. They named the place Tabera, Blaze, because fire from God had blazed up against them. Camp Kibrath Hateva. The riffraff among the people had a craving, and soon they had the people of Israel whining. Why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it free. To say nothing of the cucumbers and melons, the leeks and onions and garlic. But nothing tastes good out here. All we get is manna, manna, manna. Manna was a seed-like substance with a shiny appearance like resin. The people went around collecting it and ground it between stones or pounded it fine in a mortar. Then they boiled it in a pot and shaped it into cakes. It tasted like a delicacy cooked in olive oil. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna was right there with it. Moses heard the whining, all those families whining in front of their tents. God's anger blazed up. Moses saw that things were in a bad way. Moses said to God, Why are you treating me this way? What did I ever do to you to deserve this? Did I conceive them? Was I their mother? So why dump the responsibility of this people on me? Why tell me to carry them around like a nursing mother, carry them all the way to the land you promised to their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people who are whining to me? Give us meat. We want meat. I can't do this by myself. It's too much. All these people. If this is how you intend to treat me, do me a favor and kill me. I've seen enough. I've had enough. Let me out of here. God said to Moses, Gather together seventy men from among the leaders of Israel, men whom you know to be respected and responsible. Take them to the tent of meeting. I'll meet you there. I'll come down and speak with you. I'll take some of the spirit that is on you and place it on them. They'll then be able to take some of the load of this people. You won't have to carry the whole thing alone. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves. Get ready for tomorrow when you're going to eat meat. You've been whining to God, we want meat, give us meat, we had a better life in Egypt. God has heard your whining, and he's going to give you meat. You're going to eat meat. And it's not just for a day that you'll eat meat, and not two days, or five, or ten, or twenty, but for a whole month. You're going to eat meat until it's coming out your nostrils. You're going to be so sick of meat that you'll throw up at the mere mention of it. And here's why. Because you have rejected God, who is right here among you, whining to his face, Oh, why did we ever have to leave Egypt? Moses said, I'm standing here surrounded by 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I'll give them meat, meat every day for a month. So where's it coming from? Even if all the flocks and herds were butchered, would that be enough? Even if all the fish in the sea were caught, would that be enough? God answered Moses, so, do you think I can't take care of you? You'll see soon enough whether what I say happens for you or not. So Moses went out and told the people what God had said. He called together seventy of the leaders and had them stand around the tent. God came down in a cloud and spoke to Moses and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy leaders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they didn't continue. It was a one-time event. Meanwhile, two men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed in the camp. They were listed as leaders, but they didn't leave camp to go to the tent. Still, the spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' right-hand man since his youth, said, Moses, Master, stop them. But Moses said, Are you jealous for me? Would that all God's people were prophets. Would that God would put his spirit on all of them. Then Moses and the leaders of Israel went back to the camp. A wind set in motion by God swept quails in from the sea. They piled up to a depth of about three feet in the camp and as far out as a day's walk in every direction. All that day and night and into the next day, the people were out gathering the quail, huge amounts of quail. Even the slowest person among them gathered at least 60 bushels. 
they spread them out all over the camp for drying. But while they were still chewing the quail and had hardly swallowed the first bites, God's anger blazed out against the people. He hit them with a terrible plague. They ended up calling the place Kibrith Hatayla, Graves of the Craving. There they buried the people who craved meat. From Kibrith Hateva, they marched on to Hazareth. They remained at Hazareth. Chapter 12 Camp Hazareth Miriam and Aaron talked against Moses behind his back because of his Cushite wife. He had married a Cushite woman. They said, Is it only through Moses that God speaks? Doesn't he also speak through us? God overheard their talk. Now the man Moses was a quietly humble man, more so than anyone living on earth. God broke in suddenly on Moses and Aaron and Miriam, saying, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. The three went out. God descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance to the tent. He called Aaron and Miriam to him. When they stepped out, he said, Listen carefully to what I'm telling you. If there is a prophet of God among you, I make myself known to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But I don't do it that way with my servant Moses. He has the run of my entire house. I speak to him intimately, in person, in plain talk without riddles. He ponders the very form of God. So why did you show no reverence or respect in speaking against my servant, against Moses? The anger of God blazed out against them. And then he left. When the cloud moved off from the tent, oh, Miriam had turned leprous, her skin like snow. Aaron took one look at Miriam, a leper. He said to Moses, Please, my master, please don't come down so hard on us for this foolish and thoughtless sin. Please don't make her like a stillborn baby coming out of its mother's womb with half its body decomposed. And Moses prayed to God, Please, God, heal her. Please heal her. God answered Moses, If her father had spat in her face, wouldn't she be ostracized for seven days? Quarantine her outside the camp for seven days. Then she can be readmitted to the camp. So Miriam was in quarantine outside the camp for seven days. The people didn't march on until she was readmitted. Only then did the people march from Hazareth and set up camp in the wilderness of Paran. Chapter 13 Scouting Out Canaan God spoke to Moses, Send men to scout out the country of Canaan that I am giving to the people of Israel. Send one man from each ancestral tribe, each one a tried and true leader in the tribe. So Moses sent them off from the wilderness of Paran at the command of God. All of them were leaders in Israel, one from each tribe. These were their names. From Reuben, Shemua, son of Zacher. From Simeon, Shaphat, son of Horai. From Judah, Caleb, son of Jephunneh. From Issachar, Igel, son of Joseph. From Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. From Benjamin, Paltai, son of Rephu. From Zebulun, Gedile, son of Sodai. From Manasseh, a Joseph tribe. Gadai, son of Susai. From Dan, Amiel, son of Gamali. From Asher, Sether, son of Michael. From Naphtali, Nabai, son of Vafshai. From Gad, Gaul, son of Mekai. These are the names of the men Moses sent to scout out the land. Moses gave Hoshea, salvation, son of Nun, a new name. Joshua, God saves. When Moses sent them off to scout out Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev, and then into the hill country. Look the land over, see what it is like. Assess the people. Are they strong or weak? Are they few or many? Observe the land. Is it pleasant or harsh? Describe the towns where they live. Are they open camps or fortified with walls? And the soil, is it fertile or barren? Are there forests? And try to bring back a sample of the produce that grows there. This is the season for the first ripe grapes. With that, they were on their way. They scouted out the land from the wilderness of Zin 
as far as Rehob, toward Lebo Hemes. Their route went through the Negev desert to the town of Hebron. Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, descendants of the giant Anak, lived there. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they arrived at the Eshkol Valley, they cut off a branch with a single cluster of grapes. It took two men to carry it, slung on a pole. They also picked some pomegranates and figs. They named the place Eshkol Valley, Grape Cluster Valley, because of the huge cluster of grapes they had cut down there. After 40 days of scouting out the land, they returned home. They presented themselves before Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They reported to the whole congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told the story of their trip. We went to the land to which you sent us and, oh, it does flow with milk and honey. Just look at this fruit. The only thing is that the people who live there are fierce. Their cities are huge and well fortified. Worse yet, we saw descendants of the giant Anak. Amalekites are spread out in the Negev. Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites hold the hill country, and the Canaanites are established on the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan. Caleb interrupted, called for silence before Moses, and said, Let's go up and take the land. Now, we can do it. But the others said, we can't attack those people. They're way stronger than we are. They spread scary rumors among the people of Israel. They said, we scouted out the land from one end to the other. It's a land that swallows people whole. Everybody we saw was huge. Why, we even saw the Nephilim giants. The Anak giants come from the Nephilim. Alongside them, we felt like grasshoppers. And they looked down on us as if we were grasshoppers. Chapter 14 The whole community was in an uproar, wailing all night long. All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The entire community was in on it. Why didn't we die in Egypt or in this wilderness? Why has God brought us to this country to kill us? Our wives and children are about to become plunder. Why don't we just head back to Egypt? And right now! Soon, they were all saying it to one another. Let's pick a new leader. Let's head back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in front of the entire community, gathered in emergency session. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephuna, members of the scouting party, ripped their clothes and addressed the assembled people of Israel. The land we walked through and scouted out is a very good land. Very good indeed. If God is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land that flows, as they say, with milk and honey. He'll give it to us. Just don't rebel against God, and don't be afraid of those people. Why, we'll have them for lunch. They have no protection, and God is on our side. Don't be afraid of them. But, up in arms now, the entire community was talking of hurling stones at them. Just then, the bright glory of God appeared at the tent of meeting. Every Israelite saw it. God said to Moses, How long will these people treat me like dirt? How long refuse to trust me? And with all these signs I've done among them, I've had enough. I'm going to hit them with a plague and kill them. But I'll make you into a nation bigger and stronger than they ever were. But Moses said to God, The Egyptians are going to hear about this. You delivered this people from Egypt with a great show of strength. And now this? The Egyptians will tell everyone. They've already heard that you are God, that you are on the side of this people, that you are present among them, that they see you with their own eyes in your cloud that hovers over them, in the pillar of cloud that leads them by day, and the pillar of fire at night. If you kill this entire people in one stroke, all the nations that have heard what has been going on will say, since God couldn't get these people into the land which he had promised to give them, he slaughtered them out in the wilderness. Now, please, let the power of the Master expand, enlarge itself greatly, along the lines you have laid out earlier when you said, God, slow to get angry and huge in loyal love, forgiving iniquity and rebellion and sin. Still, never just whitewashing the sin, but extending the fallout of parents' sins to children into the third, even the fourth generation. Please, forgive the wrongdoing of this people out of the extravagance of your loyal love, just as all along, from the time they left Egypt, 
you have been forgiving this people. God said, I forgive them, honoring your words. But as I live and as the glory of God fills the whole earth, not a single person of those who saw my glory saw the miracle signs I did in Egypt and the wilderness and who have tested me over and over and over again, turning a deaf ear to me. Not one of them will set eyes on the land I so solemnly promised to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with such repeated contempt will see it. But my servant Caleb, this is a different story. He has a different spirit. He follows me passionately. I'll bring him into the land that he scouted, and his children will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and Canaanites are so well established in the valleys, for right now, change course and head back into the wilderness, following the route to the Red Sea. God spoke to Moses and Aaron. How long is this going to go on, all this grumbling against me by this evil-infested community? I've had my fill of complaints from these grumbling Israelites. Tell them, as I live, God's decree, here's what I'm going to do. Your corpses are going to litter the wilderness. Every one of you 20 years and older who was counted in the census, this whole generation of grumblers and grousers, not one of you will enter the land and make your home there. The firmly and solemnly promised land, except for Caleb, son of Jephuna, and Joshua, son of Nun. Your children, the very ones that you said would be taken for plunder, I'll bring in to enjoy the land you rejected while your corpses will be rotting in the wilderness. These children of yours will live as shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years, living with the fallout of your whoring unfaithfulness until the last of your generation lies a corpse in the wilderness. You scouted out the land for 40 days. Your punishment will be a year for each day. A 40-year sentence to serve for your sins. A long schooling in my displeasure. I, God, have spoken. I will most certainly carry out these things against this entire evil-infested community which is banded together against me. In this wilderness, they will come to their end. There, they will die. So it happened that the men Moses sent to scout out the land returned to circulate false rumors about the land causing the entire community to grumble against Moses. All these men died. Having spread false rumors of the land, they died in a plague, confronted by God. Only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, were left alive of the men who went to scout out the land. When Moses told all of this to the people of Israel, they mourned long and hard. But early the next morning, they started out for the high hill country, saying, we're here. We're ready. Let's go up and attack the land that God promised us. We sinned, but now we're ready. But Moses said, Why are you crossing God's command yet again? This won't work. Don't attack. God isn't with you in this. You'll be beaten badly by your enemies. The Amalekites and Canaanites are ready for you, and they'll kill you. Because you have left off obediently following God, God is not going to be with you in this. But they went anyway. Recklessly and arrogantly, they climbed to the high hill country. But the chest of the covenant and Moses didn't budge from the camp. The Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the hill country came out of the hills and attacked and beat them, a route all the way down to Hormah.